Hello. In this video, I will take you through the basic procedures you might use in analyzing a tracked video of an asteroid occultation. This is probably the most basic type of observation you can make, and it will illustrate most of the uh, processes and steps involved in making the analysis. First off, you need to be, be sure that you have the latest version of Ally Movie. And there's the latest version. You can get that version by going to the North American Asteroidal Occultation Program page, and you can see the link there, and scroll down to Downloads and grab Live Movie to zip file and install it in your computer. One other thing you may want to install if you haven't already at the same time is AVI Synth. This is a program that allows Live Movie to analyze files that are larger than one gigabyte. That sometimes becomes handy. So we have the current version of Live Movie in the computer, and we're ready to pull in a video frame. So let's open an AVI file. You might, might mention that certain AVI files may not work. You have to have certain codecs installed on your computer. You may need to get some additional help if that's not the case. If you open up an AVI file and it doesn't come up in Live Movie, then there's probably something with its format, and you'll need to get some help on fixing that issue. I'm going to use a video from 2015 that I took, Deborah. If I open the AVI file, here's, here's what I see. Notice it used a Kiwi timestamp. If we were to go over here and select the IOTA timestamp, you'll notice that we get all zeros because it's not reading the field properly. So let's go back to Kiwi for now. We can double check to make sure everything's being read properly. You can see here the, the field one is 2.100. If I go down here and click the button that says show field, you'll see both fields. Remember, videos are two fields combined together to make one frame, that interlacing process. And notice that the 2.100 is repeated in both the upper and lower fields. So that looks like we're reading correctly. Let me turn that back off, go back to the frame representation of our, of our video. Next up, oh, by the way, if it's not reading properly, you can change this threshold over here to a higher or lower number. That will sometimes fix the issue. If you see red for S1 or S2, then you certainly need to change the threshold. Or possibly your video is not the right format, and uh, you'll need to fix that before the, before the program can read the timestamp. All right, let's set the aperture around the target. Well, move your cursor up to where the target is. I know that's the target right there. And left-click on it. The aperture now is centered over the star. If it wasn't, it could be fixed, and I'll show you that in a minute. One of the biggest questions people have is, how big do I make these apertures? The large space here in the middle is used to analyze uh, for noise. So we want this inner red one to enclose the target. The easiest way to do that is go down here to Star Image 3D and pull up a view that shows a side view of what's going on. Hit number five here to kind of smooth things out. And now we have a representation showing the background and our target star in the middle, that little mountain right there. Notice that the red line isn't quite enclosing the entire mountain. There's, there's a little bit of uh, slope still showing up. So I'm going to increase the size of that. And when you do that, you also need to enclose or increase the size of the other um, aperture line. You don't want them too close together. I usually keep them, keep them separated by about two. Now notice the red line is enclosing our, our mountain peak pretty nicely. One other thing to notice is we have another object, either the star or hot pixel, within our outer aperture. That's not a good thing. It's going to affect how the noise is being read. So we need to remove that from the view. And I'll show you how to do that right now. So let's close this out. There's our, our object that we don't want. This particular representation of the apertures is called standard. Right? It's form of the BKG area standard. There's two others available. One is avoid sunlit face, and the other is a meteor lunar limb. I hardly ever use that one, but I do use this one. If you set that, you notice that the aperture now is swung around to avoid this star. If you still need to adjust it, you can go down here to Direction Setting and click on that uh, and grab the handles and rotate it around and then left-click again and it's set. 
Turn off PSF tracking and photometry. Those are only used if the star is saturated. That's a discussion for another time because it's pretty complicated. We don't worry about that. And then go down here. We want to track on this star. We want to keep that centered in the field of view. So we're going to set this threshold. I usually set it at 85. I don't know. 95 comes up sometimes. You want to set it to drift so it'll follow the star. And let's set the radius to about 4 so it keeps it tightly centered. All right, so we've got our tracking set to drift, radius and threshold set. We know our timestamp is reading correctly. We've turned off PSF, tracking, and photometry, and we're ready to measure. I'm going to go up to about frame 300 for this demonstration. You should measure the whole video. You want a, a good set of data before and after the occultation to provide some wing information for the analysis software. So let's start. Notice that the aperture moves around a little bit as that keeps that star centered. That's a good sign. It means the program's operating normally. You can see the times being displayed on the far right-hand side as it goes through each frame. And we're waiting for the star to disappear so we can see a change in what happens to our tracking aperture. And notice what happens. The aperture has no idea where that star is anymore. In fact, it locks on another star. Well, that's not a good thing, obviously. We need to be tracking on the target. So let's stop. Let's back up to where we were before. I'm going to go back to frame 300. And there's our tart once again. We can find that guy. We can recenter our apertures really quickly by right clicking that. Put your cursor right there, right click it, and set position only. Right now we're back to where it belongs. But what do we do to keep that star centered? Well, here's what you do. Turn off tracking. We don't want to track on that star anymore because it's not a good one to track with. Let's pick another star in the field. Once again, right click, object star add. It places a new aperture on top of that star. Let's increase the radius like we did before. Decrease the radius of the tracking so it centers it better. Let's take a look at the 3D star image. Notice that the red circle encloses that bump in the middle representing the star very nicely. So I think we're good there. We're going to drift on this star, but we're going to link it to the previous one. So press link. So our tracking star is drifting and it's linked to the first star. There's our first star. That's our target star. So we have a drifting tracking star and a target star. Let's remove all this data because we don't want it anymore. It's incorrect. We're at frame 300 like we were before. So we can start the whole process over again. Here we go. Now notice that the two apertures are moving together. The tracking is keeping lock on the tracking star and it's pulling the aperture around the target along with it just as we hope when the target disappears notice everything stays lined up the way it should we're right where we belong for the capture of the reappearance when that occurs here it is Everything is now working properly. We have a nice track on our target. I'm going to let this run a little bit longer so we can take a look at the graph and show you the, what it looks like. Right, let's stop now. Go down here and click graph. And there's a graph of our occultation. There's the tracking star. And here is the target star with the occultation obviously visible. We can change these scales a little bit if you like. Make things look prettier. They don't change the data any, but if you're going to save that graph for later use, it kind of makes it look better. We're all done with that. I might note that having this tracking star as part of the CSV file, which we're going to save here in a minute, is important sometimes because it allows us to normalize the light curve. If there's any high clouds moving through the area, they can sometimes affect what will be analyzed in, in, in our CSV file. And normalization allows us to uh, kind of level things out, so to speak. Don't forget now to save this to a CSV file. Give it a name. Uh, probably 
date, asteroid name, and your name would be good to use. And save it to your computer in some location you, you can find later on to uh, use it with our uh, analysis software. Good luck.